Good afternoon and uh, thank you for being with us here today. Um, first of all, let me greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I also bring greetings from a very small country called India <laughs> with only 101.5 million people. Yeah, but this country has been a country which has been a challenging country for us. The people who stay there and people who have been ministering into the country. I start with a word from the Bible which talks about Matthew chapter 25 verses 40 which is uh, our inspiration. In as much as you have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, you have done it to, unto me. This is the challenge which is us for us. That in a country in India where we are only 3% Christians, and 97% people of other faiths. How do we present the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people? That's challenging for us. And as you know, now at present, we have a federal government which is not a very favorable government with the minority religious groups, especially the Muslims and the Christians. Muslims are treated, are shown as the terrorists of our country. And the Christians are treated as those who will convert everybody in this country. So we are taking these two issues, the challenges which are there in front of us. How do we present the gospel of Jesus Christ? The history goes like this, that in 200 years ago, Christianity came. But this is not true because Christianity came to our country in the year 52 AD when St. Thomas came to India and St. Thomas was a martyr in while preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and as you know St. Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples who had, who had the doubting feeling of what Jesus was, whether he was resurrected. But in the sphere when we present our gospel, we have to be very careful at the same time we cannot compromise with the faith our faith because that's what the task is for our, in front of us. Jesus says go out into the world and preach the good news to the poor. So we are both spiritually handling things and as well as physically. When the gospel came was brought to the country like India it was not straightforward the gospel didn't come straight. The missionaries from different western countries have come they formed establishments like schools, colleges, hospitals through which the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached. And similarly, we also, when we preach our gospel, though our constitution of the church of, North, uh, church of the country says that we are a secular go go country, but the secularism is in court because that secularism has, has been defined by the government, whatever government comes to power, he defines it in that way. So the secular word, which the fathers of the right fathers who wrote the constitution of India uh, had in mind, the same concept was not developed in the, uh, now recently because it has changed a lot. So in that case, we also have what is called the where when the, our church is involved with certain social actions social responsibilities that are there and also uh, making uh, facing the challenges which are at present with us. Now we if we take the next slide uh, that's a, a, a very next slide these are things we have yes. So one of the challenges that that uh, the church in India takes up is a anti-human trafficking program. As you know that trafficking in, in human beings is one of the major challenges faced by the by by us where we come from the state of West Bengal. So we have got different ways of tackling this, and while we do this, we feel that we our state of West Bengal borders Bangladesh, another country. So we have a lot of cross border trafficking going on there. <coughs> And this is one of our challenges that we do. So what we do is, as a church, 
we do two types of program one is uh, awareness program and one is what is called the rescuing program while we do the awareness program we take the help of the government we take the local authorities the village villages that are we are working we take them into confidence and we work so awareness goes on in different schools colleges uh, villages and uh, and the village people have been made aware of what is there the what is this trafficking many people don't know what trafficking is now why do this trafficking take place some people think that this trafficking when they take place is only for uh maybe selling off somebody but selling a person for what we know that trafficking takes place because they can get cheap labor number 2 is uh, organ ha harvesting goes on like somebody some child is taken away and one of the organs are operated and sold it out to the other people and they the person does not know that the organ is not there anymore so organ harvesting we say that's a major thing then people this they they work as sex uh, workers uh, women work as sex workers there are people who make use of these children to do uh, work in the brick fields which is uh, hazardous which is very very dangerous for us so these are some of the actions that uh, takes place while the trafficking takes place so we are just showing that you know this has been a big challenge in the state of west bengal next so we what we do is as you as i said that we do a government with government officials we do meetings because we cannot do it alone we are a very small group of minorities in our country but we take the help of government to create awareness in the schools villages colleges and of course with the group meetings with the women and other things so next then we the whole question that lies in front of us is that when we rescue these people what are we rescuing for what is the alternative livelihood that we are giving what is the alternative livelihood because people go out they are trafficked out because they want money so if they don't get money the people will curse us so what we have devel developed is sgs means self help groups self help groups are there in in uh, in the villages that have been given work to them so that they can earn a decent living through a decent life not by their own by traffic life but by a decent life so what we do is we allow this self help groups to work in the villages so that they can get that amount of money that they lose lose if they go out of the village they can get some earnings inside their own home next so this is the livelihood we are talking about and we have meetings of livelihoods and other things next and those which we this is a school awareness program that we are doing and uh, so we gather the school we help take the help of the teachers in the villages and we make aware these awareness are not only done through lectures but we do a lot of work workshops like uh, doing painting work a run for the for the village uh, children so these are some of the way ways that we make aware aware the the this whole evil that is going on in our villages next now now i would like to say something about this because there are many ch children especially girls who are rescued by us now when they are rescued they don't have a place to stay they don't know where they come from because they have lost their houses so we are thankful to st michael's church in charleston that we had a long prayer we were praying about it that we get a shelter for them so this is st michael's uh, safe home where 21 girls stay here and for these girls and 50 are in the day care center so in total we have about 71 children who are given a new life life by life in the way that what we do is we give them education so they stay here because some of them don't know where the house is so they stay here <coughs> they have been fed they have been clothed they have been they were given school supplies and everything they did so that they can go to school now we 
in development we cannot say that we can go on feeding people and clothing people what we can do is empower people yes. so we are empowering these children so if we once they get their ed education done and if they get a proper meal if they get a proper clothing if they got proper shoes if they get proper uh, school supplies they will be interested to go to school so we provide that through this home this is a, a self help uh, this is what is called the st michael's safe home and through this, the children are being sent to local schools for education. Next. So this is our aim. Aim is to provide uh, education and shelter to the children for broken and underprivileged families. The work that started uh, six children now includes 350. So we have uh, like this four safe homes. This is one of the safe homes which is next to the Bangladesh border. Because Bangladesh is the where the cross-border trafficking takes place. So we have done uh, a safe home there. Next. So now we, we, we will see some of the statistics uh, that more than 50% of the rural children of the age of 10 cannot read or write. So basically they are illiterate. More than 50% of the children below the age of 14 drop out of schools. Minimum income of the family is more than less than one dollar a day. Twenty-five percent teachers in public schools are absent every day. So there are lack of infrastructure, schools, and other things. And then we must also understand that when we send these children into school, they are the first learners. Their parents have never gone to school, so they are full of first learners. So we need to take them specially into consideration next now this is a girl uh, there's a case story called Manju she was a tribal girl she was when she was at the age of 12 and the mother wanted was a drunkard and she she was into liquor and uh, she had left uh, she didn't have money so one day one rich man about the age of 52 came and said I can give you the money if you give your daughter so the money was given to her, him, her, and then she drank, and then the person came to take this girl, Manju, at the age of 12, and the man was 52 years old. So when the mother realized that what a mistake she has done, she came into our campus, which is a church campus. She didn't have, go to a temple, she didn't go to a mosque, but she came to a, the church and asked for help. And we had to intervene into the matter, got the police and everything, and we had to pay back the money. Uh, they paid 2,000 rupees, he said. He said he paid 10,000 rupees. So we had to pay them 10,000 rupees and get the child by. Today, Manju's case is that she is a librarian at St. Peter's School. She has got an education, she got a job. And she's got married, and she has a lovely family. This is a case of Manju. Next. This is a case of a Chandi. This is a girl from another uh, state called Bihar. They speak Hindi. They are very strong, strong Hindus. Very strong Hindus. Orthodox Hindus. And this girl was brought in to our center. She was also slaying in a slum. And she was at high risk. And we brought her from there to our center. And in the center she got her education. And now she is in the university. And also is a teacher in St. Peter's School in Durgapur. And now the, the fact is that you know when she attended the age of 18 she gave her life for Jesus Christ and she is now a Christian and she has a, she has a Christian and all her parents are Hindus and the Hindus their parents were witnessing that her, their daughter was getting baptized. This is a, the next this is another girl called Anita. She was also, she, when her father, uh, when her mother died, the father married the second time. And the, after second uh, mother came, the mother also died. She also died. So in the villages, people said, you know why your wife, you are told the father that why, you, why your wife, wives are dying? is because this girl is a witch. So she should be killed first. Then you can marry the third girl, third wife. So she was about to die because she had a high, 
105 temperature. She was lying down on the slab in the floor. <coughs> and uh, my wife went and saw that she was having temperature. And so she asked the father, why you didn't take her to the doctor? Then the father said, I want her to die. This is how she will die. And then I can marry the third wife. And then we had to take her to the hospital. She got treated. Now she's a elderly girl. She has got her nursing degrees. And the third wife never died. <laughs> the way the witch who was there still stays. She's a nurse now. She's a qualified nurse. And so this is the third. Next. This is another girl, Shush Sumita. This is a girl who uh, is very, he's a black belter of Kung Fu. She can do Kung Fu and she's a black belter. And she was excelling her life as a, as a sports teacher. So now she's a sports teacher. So this is how the life were changed through this. Next. Now our children are not only given uh, education, but also they are trained musicians. We had a missionary from England who wanted to come and share her talents. And then she trained these children up in violin, cello, double bass, and everything so they can play. And they are qualified musicians today. So these children who would have lost their life somewhere in the forest, somewhere in the slums, somewhere be trafficked out, but they have a new life today. So this is one of the things that they are learning. Next. Now, we, all, we have seen the physical, uh, what you call the ministry, what the physical ministry that we do. We also have a healing ministry, big healing ministry team. And I am thankful to St. Michael's Chancel again. I say that the mission team from there have been to India. They have worked with the, with the people. They have worked with people of other faiths. Several people have come and have received the healing touch of Jesus Christ. So this is where we say that we have another big ministry which is called the healing prayer ministry and this has touched the lives of so many people next now here we, we see that when we have this mission uh, meetings we have under the tent where two to three thousand people come and they hear the word of God and also they also receive the healing touch of Jesus Christ and uh, those who have been, uh, Jean, Johnny has been, and I, I know that uh, our friend David Richardson has been there, and of course, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Dennis is there, Dennis, uh, Lisa is not there, so Dennis is here. So many people, and of course, the daughters of the king have all, all, all the members of some of our uh, daughters have come to India, and I've seen that how through this healing touch, it is like a, it has become a like a festival of every year. So we have called it festival of joy. In India, we know everybody likes that word festival. We have 366 gods in India. And how many, did, how many days in a year? 365. And we have 366 gods. I don't know how they fit in the other god. <laughs> Where do they fit in? Anyway, but so people of India are all are like this word festival. So we have named this as festival of joy, festival of hope. So this is the, the this is the festival where they all come, and you see the uh, and the team ministering to these people, and not all are Christian, mind you. Again, I say, these are not Christian people; they are people of other faiths. See, this is the advantage with us is that India is a in a country where people have a very strong faith, and. They treat Jesus as one of their gods. So they have other, other gods. 366 God also includes Jesus. So when we say that there is a healing program going on, people come. And there are thousands of thousands of people come. Next. This is the festival of hope for the children. One Last year we did a program for the children. There were 500 children. And they were in this, like a summer camp it was, like a camp. So they stayed together, they ate together, they, uh, they learned the songs, they learned about Jesus, they did handicrafts, they did a lot of things. And so this is called the festive, Children Festival of Hope. Next. 
we we not only uh, do the healing ministry for the people but we also equip our own pastors our own pastors are equipped first because the healing team comes and goes but the work of the healing team is seen not only immediately but it follows up throughout the year we see that healing takes place and this healing takes place when why because the pastors are also equally well equipped and trained for this next these are the healing uh, prayers that are conducted one of our pastors who is trained in this he is a very powerful person even in the middle of the night he is called nowadays and uh, and people call him for the healing you know uh, somebody might be having a knee pain or somebody might be having, having some sort of a disease and so they are called in the night and prayed about it next so this is are basically our ministry of our church uh, basically we have a one is what is called the spiritual ministry one is a physical ministry and these two combine together because james says what what says prayer without action is meaningless so we combine these two things together we have a pamphlet with us uh, you can take a copy of it and uh, read it what's the work going on and we also if if people want to support a child from here that also is there you can pay it in in usa we have a friends of durgapur which is called uh, we get a, a 301c uh, exemptions are there also it's a trust here so take a copy of this and i would also say that these are some of the beautiful cards which the children have drawn and uh, we have it in our stall in india stall please come to the india stall and get a hold of this card two of these packs which are 4 and 4 8 you get for $5 so you can come and have it in the in the in the uh, uh, exhibition hall any question we have another i think 10 minutes 7 minutes more yes, sir, yes please Well, there are both. Some of them are kidnapped. Yes, they are taken away from the villages. Not only children, but mother, uh, even adult girls are also kidnapped. And some, of course, when they the tribal people, you know, when they are they are into this habit of drinking, when the tribals drink, they are mad. And so that time they can you can take away their land, you can take away anything. And later on they realize that what mistake they have gone through. So, but yeah, they are mostly kidnapped. Of, they have been stolen from there so is there anything where the parents try to find them um, cuz you mentioned like some of these children are in your home and they don't know where they belong and so you keep them yeah so i'm thinking are the, i mean if someone took my child i think i would look for them but mm-hmm. i don't understand yeah yeah but you see the the whole question is that why these are traffic because they are not taken care of by their parents and you take care of your children but they're not taking care because you see for them uh they would be interested in earning money daily if they don't earn money for themselves which means that they leave their children in the villages and they go for work outside so if a child is gone that's a profit for them but at least one meal will be less for them but some of course do f- try to find out yes we have got certain cases which they try to go to the police station to find out that's there but majority don't come back hmm. yes please um, i was just in another session here earlier and uh, learned about the caste system in, in india it's mm-hmm. completely foreign to me mm-hmm. didn't understand mm-hmm. it at all mm-hmm. um, how does that affect your congregation your church so the Good. barriers being broken down yeah Yeah. See, when if you see the religious book of the Hindus, Vedas, Vedas are the religious books of the Hindus. In the Vedas, we have to understand that when the people who wrote the Vedas had some good intention, that was a division of labor. If you say in the in the true sense, it's a division of labor. There are four castes: the Brahmin caste, which is a priestly class, they are responsible for. doing religious work 
Then we have the Khaistriyas, which is the warrior class. They defend the country. The third is the Vaishyas, who are the business people. And the fourth is the Sudras, which are the lower caste, who serve these three people, three groups of people. And the Dalits are even below them? Dalits are below that. Yes, they, they, they have no... Dalits and tribals don't come under the four caste. Mm. They only recognize caste and the four caste. And that's been written in the religious book. So, accordingly, there are. But then, in the years to go, uh, when, you know, many people have misinterpreted that whole caste system into oppressing people and giving them hard life for them. But when the caste system was written in the books of Vedas, it was clear that it is division of labor. Of course, when the mostly the Christian missionaries when they came from the West, they were first of all converting these lower caste people because the lower caste people were oppressed by the higher caste. So if you see most of them, you see our uh, the difficult part is that if you if you read my name Probal Datta, so when you come to the title Datta, anybody will in India will know what caste I am in. So, so when Gandhiji was there, he said, if you are Harijan, means a lower caste, don't say your title. Only say Prabhal. Nothing else. Then people don't know. But it has also affected the church. Yes. The Dalits, the tribals, are the oppressive class, or even among the church also. Because the church, though we say we are a Dalit church, we are a tribal church, where Dalits and the tribals form the majority of our country, but still the church also victimizes these people. So it's a very, it's a concept very strange to, to us as a Yes. Very strange. Yes. yes. But you have a Dalit church. We have a Dalit church and a tribal church. 75% of my area is a tribal, mm. tribal area. Well, they, have Christ? They, they have introduced Christ. The mission bodies of the West have introduced Christ. See, when St. Thomas came to our country, it was 52 AD. Right. That was, if you see the whole India map, it was down south that he was preaching. But the, all over India, they didn't preach. So that is why the southern part of India, we have a link with the Syrian Christians of Syria and Middle East. Whereas the, when the Western missionaries, British people and American people, they all came to our country. They started actually evangelizing the whole country. That's the time when they started the evangelism. So they did a good job. Yeah, yeah. But people, you know, lower caste people felt that once you become a Christian, you are of no caste. So you are relieved out of the caste system. See? That was advantage for them. Yes, please. I was wondering if, if the other religions within India do humanitarian, charitable work the way the church does. Oh yes, there are, there are uh, other groups of people also do humanitarian work now. Like the Sikhs. The Muslims have now got into it. The Hindus have got into it. Uh, so they are doing also the uh, charitable work. But you see, their approach of charitable work is through a religion. That if you want to take the advantage of this, either you have to be a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh. But Christians, when the Christians open up the doors for people, they don't see what color you come from, which caste you come from, which religious background you come from. We take it everybody and we help them. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. I, I would say that, see, uh, I would say that under the current government, yes, we are under a scanner. Mm -hmm. But our mainline churches have not gone into this persecution. 
when churches become extremist mm -hmm. when they say declare certain things like if you publicly say that oh, okay within 20 25 i'm going to convert the whole of this country mm -hmm. that's dangerous for us and therefore these people who make these extremist extremist uh, uh, propagation are caught into problems mm -hmm. but mainline churches like us we we don't get into that problem of course, government is not even favoring us, but this, they are looking at us. But we have our own way of doing it, we, because we are a mainline church. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. First of all, let me tell you, in India, if you, become, you want to change your faith, first of all, you have to go to a first-class magistrate and declare in front of the magistrate that you are embracing this faith on your own under London, no strings and no pulls and no pressures. That you have to declare. When the first class magistrate signs the order, then it comes to the bishop. And then only we can start our process of teaching catechism and teaching uh, before the baptism will take place. So it's a difficult task. You just cannot say that. And those churches who have gone into this become, you know, they say, okay, fine, uh, we have 500 people baptized today. It means nothing. They can take you to court also. So we are not taken to court because you have made an affidavit in front of the first class magistrate that you are embracing this faith on your own and not by compulsion. So when we have those documents with us, legal documents with us, it is easy for us to do the baptism. That's, that's the way the government can keep track of how many yes. of, of what's going on in the country. Absolutely. And we also defend ourselves to say that we have not done it forcibly. Here is the affidavit by the magistrate. Adding another one? Yes, it is adding, because you see, preaching will be very, not very difficult, because they know that he is a God, Jesus is a God. But to know Jesus, you have to deepen, deepen yourself. Now there are 66 God, 366 gods, uh, okay, fine, one God coming after that. But I don't have any affiliation to one God. In order to have that affiliation to one God, in order to understand that one God, you need to go deeper into it. So we have to teach what is the uniqueness of Jesus from other faiths. Otherwise, why should they come? Because India, in India we have a very old heritage of different gods. And Jesus is, you know, you have to prove to them that he is unique in your life and my life. Yes, because see, Brahmin class is an educated class. So, when the Presbyterian Church of uh, of uh, Presbyterian Church from USA as well as uh, from England, the Church of Scotland, we say, they came. Their whole intention was those who decide the fate of these three class of people, we should convert them first. So there are people very slow. That conversion is very slow because. They are intellectually sharp. They are well versed with their own faith. And then you have to be well versed to produce Jesus as a unique than their faith. So we do have conversion among the higher caste also. <coughs> yeah, that's true. When the caste system is only in India, when they come out of the country, they cannot live on their caste system anymore. So they forget. Now, nowadays we can see even, even among the Christians, I would say that uh, previously, when they married somebody, they were seeing that they had a caste equality. But now it is all gone because, you know, things have changed, people are changing, and therefore the caste system is also driving off. See? So they don't feel it in that way. They feel that they are all one now. You can always talk to him because, you see, as I said, when we present Jesus, to these people of other faiths, they will listen to you. Because they feel that Jesus is also one God. So why not listen to this God also? I am listening to Rama, I am listening to Krishna, I am listening to Ganesh, I am listening to Durga, I am listening to Jesus. Does so, he, do the other gods forgive sins? The no. no. You see, that, that is where we have to be unique. We have to present ourselves. Your God is teaching us to to slaughter a cow and a goat for our, my sin. You see, that 
animal's blood will cleanse my sin. And here is one the one faith, Jesus Christ, who himself gave his life for my sake. So that's a unique difference here. You know. Both are being cleansed by blood. One is the animal the blood, one is Jesus himself, God's blood. That's the uniqueness we have to present. So you need to know the Hindu scriptures, you need to know the Christian scriptures, and you can present it. Anyway, I think the time is up now. I think thank you very much for us, and we will ask uh, uh, Johnny is here to say a word of prayer and close it. Yeah. Let us pray. Our Father, our God, we are we're just so thankful that we do know the unique Jesus. That our sins have been forgiven because of what He did for us on the cross. And Lord, we pray for uh, India and all the millions and millions of people that do not know uh, Jesus' uniqueness. We pray, Lord, for more missionaries, more people to share the gospel. Bless us now. Thank you for Bishop Dada and, and all that, uh, that their church does and continues to do. Just bless them and anoint them. And we give you all the thanks, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank